apologies for being tardy. Um, so, like, where do we start with step four? Where do, what do we talk about? Like, you know, there's kind of, in my opinion, there's a couple aspects of step four. There's the aspect of step four when somebody's brand new and what that looks like when they're new, right? It's a, it's a pretty simple formula for when somebody's new, in my opinion. You know, we, we look at the first three columns and that's fairly simple for the new guy because they've been living those first three columns their whole life. You know, they know who it is, they know what's happened to them and they know that it's hurt them. But that is as far as most of us ever got. The world and its people were often quite wrong. Um, but as we kind of look deeper into the step four, as we get time in, right? Mm -hmm. Through that first set of steps, we look at the fourth column and the fourth column is, it's very important. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm gonna hack it up a bit here. But the fourth column gets all the attention in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the only thing anyone ever talks about is that fourth column. Yeah, the fourth column is important when you're doing your first year or two to kind of get a hold on like your part. But really, when we say our part, it's not really our part, because the book is really clear. It says we resolutely look for our own mistakes. You know, we don't look at other people's mistakes in the step four or any of this personal inventory. So when we really do look at step four, we got to get out of our minds that the other person played any part at all, period. We look for our own mistakes. The inventory was ours, not the other person. And that's important for momentum. You know, I'm, I'm uh, strict on the directions in the big book. And I think what happened over the years is AA has been watered down with a lot of opinions and theories. And the opinions and theories and the philosophy of God has really taken over. So a lot of people have really suffered in their recovery. But really looking at what the wording is saying in the book and following those words. So another thing that I want to talk about here, and this is more for for the guy who's done a set of steps or the guy who's, you know, a year sober, you know, two years sober, but is still really, really struggling. Because I find most people who are still struggling at two and three and four and five and 15 years, and I'm not saying that life doesn't have its challenges and there's some struggles for sure. But the person who chronically struggles in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is missing something, in my opinion. And what they're typically missing is they're typically missing the step 10 aspect. And the step, step 10 aspect, the clear-cut directions, there's a huge component of step four in it, right? And I'm just going to spout it off quickly so that we are on the same page. It's on page 84 in the big book, and it says we continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove it. We talk to somebody immediately. We resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. That's it. So that's a process for a spot check inventory as we go through our day to day. But if there's lingering resentments or there's lingering defects, there's lingering things that we've learned about in the step four, and these things have the ability to change and morph how they're presenting themselves in our life. So we got to be aware and we got to be conscious of what's going on. What are we thinking? What are we feeling? But if there's something lingering, maybe it's jealousy, maybe it's a resentment to somebody, maybe it's, you know, judgment, maybe it's whatever it is. We go back to the step four and we write it out again. Maybe it's only one or two names on this list. And then we start going through that whole process again. And we get back to the fourth column. We look at our part. We get back to the fifth step and we discuss it with somebody and God. And we talk about it. And we become willing in the sixth step again. And then we turn it over in the seventh step. And then we go possibly make our list and make our amends again. And why that's super important is because people figure once they're done a set of steps that they kind of got this figured out in their mind. Well, the book's really clear. It says a solace, solitary self-appraisal is not sufficient. So we got to constantly be going back to pen and paper and going back to the step five 
going back to the willingness of a step six. And really what step six is, is the awareness to really want to change this habit, whatever it might be. So as we kind of keep moving through the step four over the years that we're staying sober, okay, let's do another set of steps. We kind of get back into the the book again and we do the first column, no problem, we're pros at it. We do the second column, third column, fourth column. But now the third column becomes the most important column in our lives in the step four process. It's actually the most important column in our lives as we grow in this whole program. Because when we're working a step 10, we're actually trying to find the root of the third column. When the book talks about we ask our Heavenly Father to remove these things root and branch, we can easily see the branches on the first couple of years as, become, as we become aware of our defective character, these not so subtle behaviors. But it's more of the subtle behaviors that we now need to tap into. It's kind of like a tree. You know, when you look at a tree, the whole life force of that tree actually lives under the ground. And everything that you see above the ground on that tree actually comes from the nutrients and what's going on underneath the ground where you can't see it. And so for us, it's very similar. We can look at the defects. We can look at the resentments. We can look at these branches and we can start working on them in that first year or two. We can start breaking these branches. Let's say the defects are the branches. And the further you get on the end of the tree is, you know, where, the, where you can work on the defect. And when you take a branch of a tree, you can easily break the end of the branch. And then you start working towards more of the trunk of the tree. And now you're starting to break this branch that's thicker and it becomes harder. It takes more effort. Very similar to the defects as they start becoming more cunning, baffling, and powerful. Then you work your way right to the trunk of the tree, and now you can't really break this. You need help. You need help to break this defective branch of the tree. And then as you work your way down that tree over years and years of working a solid program based on the directions out of the big book, and a huge part of that in step four, now you get down to the root. You know in step three where it says, Selfish self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our trouble. When he says the root, he means down there where you can't see it. Um, we are driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. When you look up the word driven, it means propelled by an unseen force. <laughs> so we're driven by that unseen force below the, below the surface that we can't see driven by fear, self-seeking, self-pity. Those things are the broken parts of our wholeness that need the relief. And those are the things that overreach themselves and become the defects. So at some point, we got to get down to the root of these branches. And we got to start looking at what the real problem is and where it's coming from. The problem with getting into these roots, very similar to when we do a first step forward. We start acknowledging certain things about ourselves that's very humiliating. I'm going to talk about humility for a second. This is my version of humility. Humility has three levels. It has the first level is humiliation. Second level is humble through pain. And the third level I take right out of the 12 and 12. And it's the desire to seek and do God's will. The only way to get to the third level is you have to go through the bottom two levels in whatever aspect of growth you need. So when we're looking at ourselves in those first couple step fours, there's a lot of things that we look at and we're like kind of humiliated about. You know, I remember for me, I was like, you know, the way that I might treat my employees or the way that I treated my wife and my family at times. And my old ego used to rationalize and justify why I treated people like that because I wanted the best for them. But really, I look at that today and I call it false integrity. Because I had to tell myself a lie, many lies in my life through untreated alcoholism and addiction. I had to tell myself many lies. And because I needed to look at myself in the mirror every day. So I needed to be okay with myself. 
But the reality is, is if I was to really peel back the layers of that lie and see the truth, I wasn't happy with myself in the way that I acted. So it's a false integrity, but real integrity is based on honesty and truth, right? Those false integrities, when you peel back the layers, they were based in fear and control and ego. So today when we do a step four, we got to get through some layers. Okay, that's why I'm talking mainly about the person who's got some time in and you want to keep growing or you're struggling in the program and you don't really know why. I have a saying, if you don't deal with the shit, when the shit comes up, the shit will deal with you. And we see that in the program everywhere, guys that are sober committing suicide, guys that are sober drinking, guys that have three or five seven years sober, they drink or whatever it might be. And it's my belief that these guys aren't dealing with the shit when the shit comes up, either because they're too focused on the world of the material, i.e. step 10, resting on their laurels, being complacent. And the word complacency means being satisfied with one's own self. They're getting what they think they need. They're getting what they want. But the program's not based about getting what we need anymore. It's about being of maximum service to God and the fellows about us. That's what the program is. Our, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service. The whole, the whole emphasis on step four is basically in the step three prayer, right? Build with me, do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Take away my difficulty so that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. What are my difficulties? My difficulties are my defects of character because they're all based in my own self-centered fear. And I want to get those taken away. But the problem is, is I need to be victorious over them. The word victory in that step three prayer ensues that there's a fight somewhere so this isn't an easy battle it's a battle between my old patterns of security and with a new way of life and trying to bring god in and having me align with god's will <laughs> which is not an easy process because these things have protected me for so long in my life and they're not just coming out of the top of my brain, they're coming from the deepest part of my security in my being to try to help me keep something that makes me feel secure. So I wanna read something with you guys to kind of hammer a little bit of this home. If you open up your 12 and 12s to a part, just give me one sec. Page 50 in the 12 and 12 at the step four segment. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. And then I want to read another little piece. And this all has to do with like third column stuff in the step four. Okay. So second paragraph, but first full paragraph. By now the newcomer has probably arrived at the following conclusions. Well, the newcomer doesn't arrive at these conclusions. That's kind of a misprint. The newcomer does not arrive at these conclusions. He might have in 1935, 39, when the these, you know, when the big book was actually being followed to a T, but nowadays it's not really true. That is character defects representing instincts gone astray. Boom, there it is. His character defects that are representative of the instincts gone astray have been the primary cause of his destructive drinking and failure at life. On the contrary, it's the character defects representing the instincts that causes failure at life that make him drink. Unless he is now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him. That all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out and built upon a new bedrock. So what that's saying is, unless this person, us, is willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude him. 
So we'll, we look around the rooms and we see the guys or the women that don't work on their defects, they typically get loaded again. And the guys who are in the program who are still screwing around with their defects, they don't have a lot of peace of mind. And there's a lot of guys suffering, men and women suffering in the program that haven't taken what we just read seriously because they haven't heard the message of the third column being the most important column as you continue your sober journey. That all of the faulty foundation of life will have to be torn out and built upon a new bedrock. So the faulty foundation of our lives is based on self. Everything revolves around us and that is the first line in the step three prayer. God build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Take away this bondage of self. Please chip away at the foundation of what I built my life on. Not only have I built my life on self so I can protect myself from maybe some of the traumas that I've had and experienced, but the world of the material and the belief systems within the world of the material all have a foundation of self built into it as well. And all of the information that we get, like, okay, Bill, you're in pain today. Go do this massage and get out of pain for you so that you can be happy. You know, if you're in a relationship, you know, you and your partner go take a trip over here to Mexico or wherever for you. It's telling us to avoid the pain, right? We're totally told to avoid pain at all costs so that you can be happy. The problem is when society tells us that we're not using our God-given abilities to grow and learn through the pain. And that's part of this journey, right? So we need to chip away self. And the step four and the rest of the steps is exactly what that does. When we look at the 12th tradition, where it talks about anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, uh, placing person, uh, principles before personalities. Most people think about that tradition as, you know, I need to stay anonymous. I'm supposed to stay anonymous. I'm not supposed to out other people or myself. That's not what the tradition means at all. What it means at all, like for real, is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions is anonymity, meaning the steps and the traditions allow you to become faceless, to become nothing, essentially. That's what the steps do. When we practice the, practice the steps and we follow the processes in the steps, we can become a worker among workers, a friend among friends, and a family member among family members. We don't rise to the top and we don't hide underneath it. And we can just be okay with who we are. And that's the other thing that the steps do. It allows us to be okay with who we are. And now back to that little piece of the reading that all the faulty foundation of his life will have to be torn out and built upon a new bedrock. Well, remember back in the We Agnostics chapter, it said, does he believe or is he even willing to believe in a power greater than himself? If he says, yes, he's willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. And then it says, upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual could be built. So that's what we're trying to build on is this willingness to believe in God upon the simple cornerstone. And in the reading we just read, it's like building upon a new bedrock. The cornerstone is a piece of the foundation that goes in a foundation that keeps the building straight and that sets everything together. So as we're building on this new foundation and removing the old self, it says it could be built. This wonderfully effective spiritual structure could be built. doesn't say it is built because we got to learn how to turn it over to God to actually build it. So God can't be a theory anymore. And part of God not being a theory anymore is identifying where our own selves are still cunning, baffling, and powerful and running our lives through step four work. So now I want to go back to page 42 for a second. In the 12 and 12. And this is a piece that I've brought into my sponsorship for about the last six years. And most of my sponsorship, I sponsor on the design for living. 
When I take somebody new, whether they be a wet alcoholic, meaning somebody struggling with the substance, or whether they be a two year or five or 15 or 20 year member, I never focus on the substance. The substance to me is the defective character. The substance to me is the gambling. The substance to me is the relationship. The substance to me is the pornography. The substance is any defective character that I will put in the alcoholic cycle when I'm restless, irritable, and discontent to get some type of a relief from. And when you look at whatever it is that you put in the alcoholic cycle to get relief from, you're trying to get your ego relief, something that's fear-based. But that's why we need God in that alcoholic cycle for all of these things, for these character defects, because God doesn't need anything. God's God at all. He's powerful. doesn't need anything. So creation gave us instincts for a purpose. Without them, we wouldn't be complete human beings. If men and women didn't exert themselves to be secure in their persons, made no effort to harvest food or construct shelter, there would be no survival. If they didn't reproduce, the earth wouldn't be populated. If there were no social instinct, if men cared nothing for society of one another, there would be no society. So these desires for sex relation, material and emotional security and for companionship are perfectly necessary, right and surely God given. Those four instincts are so important in long term sobriety to start understanding and start tying to your defects. Okay. And they're so important, like in great Bill W. fashion, he mentions them again. And not only alcoholics and addicts have these defects, all human beings, or these instincts, I should say, all human beings have these instincts. Yet these instincts, so necessary for our existence, often far exceed their proper functions. Powerfully, blindly, many times subtly, they drive us. They dominate us, and they insist upon ruling our lives. So our desires for material, emotional security, and for an important place in society often tyrannize us. Thus, when out of joint, man's natural desires cause him great trouble, practically all the trouble there is. So just stopping there and thinking about this. If you're suffering great trouble, in your recovery, in your life. I'm betting it's based in your instincts. Something that has to do with your sex relation, material, emotional security, and companionship. Or it could be a combination of all of them. But all of the suffering that we have in our lives comes from those four instincts. All of the defects that we have come from those four instincts as well. No human being, however good, is exempt from these troubles. Nearly every serious emotional problem can be seen as a case of misdirected instinct. When that happens, our great natural assets, the instincts, have turned into physical and mental liabilities. Okay, I'm going to go back up a bit on the paragraph. Yet these instincts, so necessary for our existence, often far exceed their proper functions. Powerfully, blindly. Many times subtly, they drive us, dominate us, and insist upon ruling our lives. What does that look like? Well, what did it look like to me? Well, I'm going to say, I'll use a couple examples here. Let's say there's three or four of us in a, in a room, let's say an AA room or whatever, any fellowship room, and there's three or four of us men, and we're just kind of hanging out, and we're there before the meeting starts. And we're just shooting the shit, you know, kind of being boys, bugging each other, joking around, having some laughs. And then all of a sudden, a very pretty woman walks in the room. Boom. The instincts kick in powerfully, subtly. These things will drive us, dominate us, insist upon ruling our lives. Okay, my one buddy who's a juice monkey, he gets up and he's now walking over to the coffee maker. And why he's doing that is he wants to be noticed, right? And he's like now pulling up his sleeves on his, on his arm to show his watch, right? 
my other buddies like you know quits talking quits being funny and now he's like totally being arrogant and is not talking to us and like everybody changes a little bit because this woman walks in so powerfully blindly no one saw it coming we don't see these things coming um, many times subtly these things drive us and they dominate us and they insist upon ruling our lives so this exact same scenario could happen every day of the week with these same guys and you know what the behaviors will be very similar and even maybe one of my buddies goes up and talks to her because that's one of his things that he does and he may even leave the meeting with her and then what does he do with his buddies he ghosts us he doesn't call us until he needs us again. Why? Because he's selfish and self-centered to the core. He's self-seeking to the core because he's only trying to get what he wants. And the other thing about, you know, some of these behaviors, like I've worked with men and women in the program and every single thing that they do is driven by the instincts, but it's typically the opposite sex. So the, from the moment they wake up in the morning, it's like they look in the mirror and they think about how they look to somebody else. From the shoes they put on to the watch they put on, maybe they got to go buy a car today. And they're looking at the car they're buying, but in their mind they're thinking, how am I going to look in that? How is this woman going to look with me in that? How many women can I get with this car? You know, every single thing in their life is dictated by the instinct. And these are the things that drive all of our defective character. So let's keep going. Never, nearly every serious emotional problem can be seen as a case of misdirected instinct. When that happens, our great natural assets, the instincts, have turned into physical and mental liabilities. So if we don't get a handle on these instincts and start identifying Okay, we can identify the fourth column and see what the what the behavior is, but we got to start looking at where it's coming from. And we got a little hint of that in our first step five, but sometimes I don't even believe most people get the value of it out of a step five that they're supposed to get. Because a lot of people don't want to sponsor, first of all, and if they do want to sponsor, they most of them don't want to talk about sex conduct you wouldn't believe the number of people that i've sponsored that said that the step five they did was an hour long an hour and a half long and they just read a confession and or the person that took them through the steps never wanted to do the sex conduct with them the sex conduct has all of the data in it it's relationship conduct. We're in relations with every other human being on a constant basis. We have to go through the sex conduct with the people we're working with so that we understand our own sex conduct, our own defects, our own behaviors, our own instincts. When I sit down in front of another person, I'm looking at myself, talking to myself, listening to myself. And if I can get into like a talk about sex conduct with somebody else, at first it's really kind of like weird, right? It's kind of like strange. But that's just the ego afraid of something again. Once you understand that everybody has sex troubles, we hardly be human if we didn't. And we start looking at the relationship components, not necessarily sex, of how humans interact. Now we're starting to bring up some of our own defective character and instinctual desires that are overreaching themselves. This is the best way to ever be able to keep a finger on the ones that we have in ourselves is through sponsorship. So let's keep reading here. And then I'm going to stop reading out of this 12 and 12. So step four is a vigorous and painstaking effort to discover what these liabilities in each of us have been and are. Vigorous and painstaking. Vigorous means we go at it and we work a program on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you look at step 10, it says we vigorously commence this way of living. 
So we're vigorously commencing a way of living. And now again, here it says vigorous. This isn't like we do this for a little while and, and just stop doing it because we feel better and we think we got this because more is always revealed. And if you don't keep digging into the more, the shit that's going to deal with you will deal with you. And although you can in your mind think that you're going to be okay, it's not where the mind, it's not in the mind of where it actually matters. It's deep below the roots is where it matters. Because the ego can rationalize and justify the most errant nonsense to suit my actions and my inaction at any given time in sobriety or not in sobriety. But I got to be more aware of that as I grow in my sobriety because it gets more cunning. So step four, vigorous painstaking effort to discover what these liabilities in each of us have been and are. Okay, that's pretty revealing. What have they been? I guess it's kind of talking about the past. What have they been in the past and what are they today? In the step five, it talks about we're prepared for a long talk. And it also says about our whole life story. That's what we're talking about. Sometimes we need to go way back in a long talk and talking about the whole life story. And why do we need to do that at different intervals of our recovery? Because we need to reveal some of the shit that's going to reveal itself later in our recovery and screw us over. So if we can keep like, you know, what what's bugging me today? Maybe it's something in the past. Maybe it's something today. Well, it is today. Where did it start? Next paragraph. We want to find out exactly how, when, and where our natural desires have warped us. Boom. More revealing information. We want to find out exactly how, when. When did it happen? How did it happen? Where did our natural desires warp me? Here's a good example. So a lot of guys I work with, they have relationship troubles, porn troubles, lust troubles, relationship hopping. Relationship hopping is such a huge defect that people don't see. So it's really important to note relationship hopping. And part of relationship hopping is how long have you ever been single in your life, right? I'm not going to get into that one right now. I could easily, but I'll stick to my first example. So I work with these guys with these different sex relation companion, you know, instinctual troubles. And uh, I'm like, well, why do you keep jumping from woman to woman? And why do you treat them so terribly? And then we get into the step five work. And, you know, over the first four or five steps, I get to know this guy pretty good. And I start seeing a thing or two. And, and I realize as I'm doing a step five, I'm like, oh, my God. You and your cousin found a porn magazine underneath your uncle's bed when you guys were kids. And what did you guys do when you pulled that porn magazine out? Well, we just started looking at it and we started like, you know, making fun of the women. And and then we started like playing with ourselves and, you know, having, you know, sex with ourselves, me and my cousin. Right there. Boom. How? When? That's the beginning of a defective character. Not always necessarily, but in the instance I'm giving you, bingo. I found something way back in the history. And then it's like, okay, then then how did your relationship with your cousin progress and um, with women? Well, you know, I ended up, my dad was, you know, at home one night and he had to run to work and then I went on his computer and the the porn page was open so I just started watching porn and you know I watched porn ever since I figured out how to use it on my dad's computer when I was young and then I got a phone when I was eight and no one ever said anything to me so really right off the bat what's happening with this guy is he's now objectifying women he is now making a woman something that men use and it started when he was little when he found the magazine and then it's grown and it's grown and it's grown and then you know whatever happens in his teenage years 
and how he treats them. While the group of guys that I was with, you know, they all kind of had girlfriends and they didn't treat them very well. And that was kind of my MO. And so it just worked. So then he became a dominant guy and looked for weaker women. And so then, you know, to make a long story short, I'm working with the guy at 40 or 50 years old and he can't have a relationship. He's still getting on porn. He doesn't respect women in the level of respect where he treats them like a human being, partly because society has objectified them too. And women to some degree have lived up to that belief that society's entrenched on us. So we found out exactly how, when, and where his natural desires warped him. We wish to look squarely at the unhappiness this has caused others and ourselves. So we're going to look at all the instances in this gentleman's relationship, whether he's caused unhappiness and where there's been unhappiness within him. And that step, the sex conduct in the big book really pulls that out. Whom did we hurt? Where was I selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Not just with the person, but also with anybody attached to that whole situation. Where was I selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? And the other thing about that sex conduct, and I'm kind of switching gears a bit here, and resentments, but mostly in the sex conduct, it says, whom did we hurt? Well, as I screw around with a woman and I use her like a yo-yo for five years and I kind of use her at my own back and call, every time I broke up with this woman, she would run back to her family and to her friends and she was so disturbed that she couldn't even really be a parent. So not only did I disturb her and I was inconsiderate to her, I actually hurt her whole family. So these people also go on the list because it wasn't just her that I hurt. She couldn't be a good mom because I screwed her up so emotionally and mentally that she had to go and give her kids to her mom every time we broke up for like two months so she could get her shit together again. So the kids go on there. Her best friend always had to take her in and, and coddle her back to being okay. Her best friend goes on there. Her parents go on there. So me as a perpetrator and hurting people, instead of just putting Mary on the list, I have Mary and all of her family on that list now. Why? Because I need to see in black and white and get that humility of humiliation and go look at what you're doing, bro. Look at who you're hurting. And then I need to grow out of that. Whereas the step eight and nines come in, right? Living a different amends and the willingness of step six that stuff kind of all comes to play together in this so that we can grow and we can learn and we can heal and the thing about the thing about these instincts that there's four of them and as we act out in whatever instinct it is a lot of times we're acting out maybe primarily in one instinct but all the other instincts are attached to it and i'm going to say through my experience as a sponsor the instinct that probably has the most attachment or the most um commotion attached to it is the instinct for emotional security and so when i'm working on healing and i'm finding out my fourth column maybe what i did and I'm looking more at the third column now and finding out, you know, exactly how, when, and where these things disturb me, where in my past. And it's not just our past, it's also belief systems that we get indoctrinated in from school and from the world of the material itself. There's a lot of things in the world of the material that actually give us skewed versions of who we are, and they actually go against who we are. But we don't know that because we're, we're the fish in the water that doesn't know he's in water. We're so indoctrinated within the systems. And the work that we do is so counter to the culture we live in. That's why we have to kind of stay together and be on the journey together because it goes against what everybody else is doing. 
And so I guess my point to that was, as we start healing, you know, in the end of the We Agnostic story where, where Bill W. has his full spiritual awakening, blah, 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 and the problem of alcohol been removed? Anyway, it goes on to say, what is this but a miracle of healing? Circumstances made him willing to believe. Through every single circumstance that we encounter is the miracle of healing. That's why step 10 is so important in the step four talk. Through every interaction with everything in your life, you have an opportunity to heal. Whether you're going to take the opportunity and be able to see it is something different. But if you're not working a solid program, you won't have the opportunity to see it and try to heal it. And you won't be able to pierce through those belief systems that you've been thinking that are good for you for 25 years and then finally go, you know what? This belief system is not good for me. I need to change this. God, please build with me, do with me as thou wilt. Show me where I can grow and where I can learn. And be willing to listen to your intuition and your spirit and your heart and not your mind. And it tells us that on page 85 in the big book. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. God has the knowledge and the power, not us. But we have to tap into the knowledge and the power by removing all the things that aren't God, which is what the step four begins to do and it can continue to do if we work this program in our day-to-day -day lives over time. If you have carefully followed directions, you have felt the flow of his spirit into you. To some extent, you'll become God conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. So we're trying to develop this God consciousness and this vital sixth sense. And when we hear vital in the big book, we usually think means important. How about making it think like it means it gives you life? The word vital comes from vitality, means gives you life. So as we work on each circumstance, we can heal ourselves a little bit at a time and primarily in the emotional security, but it's all attached. So when you're working on healing one thing, whether it's at work or your family or your kids or something that you know about and nobody else does, you're actually healing all the things. But we don't stop. The minute we say no, never, we, we, we veer off on a path that's not good for us. That's why willingness has to be an indispensable. And we keep trying. So... You know, I know I didn't get into a lot of the step four, like right out of the big book talk today, but I could talk on step four, like for a long time. There's a lot of information and data in it, um, but I think I want to finish off with one little thing here. Um, I'm just going to open the book because I might not remember exactly how it's said. Okay, it's on uh, page 64. Therefore, we started on a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding, fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods and get rid of them promptly without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about the values. So we're doing a fact-facing, a, a fact-finding, fact-facing process. It's an effort to discover the truth about stock in trade. Really what that's saying is, what stock are you carrying within your store on, of yourself? And what are you trading with everybody else? What stock is it? The truth about stock in trade. The truth about my stock in trade, as I was trading anger and manipulation for their fear so that they could be submissive and they would give me what it is that I thought I wanted. And I've seen enough people that, that, that use their sexual prowess as a stock in trade to get what they want out of men. 
And I've seen men with their money use that stock in trade and use it in a subtle and a, a way that's in, based on that false integrity where they think it's okay, but it's really based in selfish and self-seeking, self-centered motives. What What is it in our own stock in trade that we're trading with other people? That's what we're doing here. You know, it's the owner of the bit and to get rid of them promptly without regret. First, you got to be aware of them. And if you're not working with a sponsor or God centered 12 step pillar and or asking God to reveal these things, they're not going to reveal themselves to you because you have a mind that rationalizes and justifies fucking everything. So it's imperative that we have other people that will call us on our shit care more about our lives and our well-being than our feelings and we have to have enough humility to be able to hear that from somebody and not let our sensitiveness and our pride get hurt knowing that we're collective community here trying to grow in a good way if the owner of the business is to be successful he cannot fool himself about the values we will often fool ourselves about the values which is why all of the components of recovery are so important because they all work together on the journey of healing. And I'll finish it off with this. The 12 steps give me a lot. The 12 steps showed me a lot, took away a lot, and gave me a lot of value in my life. But working with others, the component of 12-step work of working with others has given me everything. Everything that I've talked to you about today, everything that I know about these books, and I know these books inside out, has come through sponsorship. And if you knew who I was 10 years ago, who I am today, you would I'm unrecognizable in my character because of sponsorship and my willingness to try to serve God and, and this book, which didn't come overnight. It came through a consistent, persistent commitment to change. So I think, um, you know, I think my time might be done. I know you guys were supposed to be done at, uh, on my clock. It would have been noon. I'm sorry that I was late. I must have had my time zones wrong. But, you know, I hope you guys got some value of what, have I, what I said today. And if you ever want to get in touch with me, just feel free to reach out to one of the administrators and they'll hook you up with my number. and. You know, I just like to help people. That's all I got.